Hello, namaste and a very good evening. You're watching Chitti Media and I'm your host, Sharon Sethi. In the 100-year marathon, Michael Pillsbury marshals a lot of evidence showing the Chinese government has a detailed strategy to overtake the US as the world's dominant power. They want to do this by 2049, which marks the centennial, centennial uh, year of uh, China's uh, communist revolution. What does China's President Xi Jinping want? Four years before Donald Trump became president, Xi Jinping became the leader of China and he announced an epic vision to in effect make China great again, calling for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. The strategy has been very well documented in Chinese literature, published and sanctioned by organizations uh, of the People's Liberation Army for well over 50 years. Sadly, China doesn't even consider India to be a near peer competitor, which the United States uses for China in return. It just sees us as a neighboring power which, with which it has unresolved issues on the borders. How does India plan to grow? Will we be able to get ahead of the Chinese other questions I'm going to be asking my guest Abhijit Chavda today. Abhijit ji, namaste. It's very good to have you back on our channel. Namaste. Great to have, great to be back. Thank you for having me. How have you been? Good, good. Abhijit ji, let me begin by asking you: Does India even have a vision plan for what we want to be in 2047? And most importantly, is it a shared vision? especially because of the bold and uh, binaries that we see in politics today. We are not even sure if we have a collective vision together. Well, the uh, political system in India is such that it is very hard for any government which is currently in power to have a long-term 50-year vision. The system is such that the system is unstable. Every five years, there's an election, and you don't really know who's going to come to power in the next term. So it's really hard for India to have a long-term vision. So I expect that every single political party which aspires to be in power or which is in power right now would have a long-term vision for the country, but it has never been explicit, explicitly stated. So for instance, the current government of India, which is uh, the ruling party is the BJP, it has never published a 50-year vision or a, or a vision 2047 as such for India. As far as I know, it's not been done. And neither has any other political party. So the system is such that it is not possible for a party to be sure that it's going to be in power for the next 20 years or 30 years. And therefore, it's very hard for them to have a vision like that. I am sure that the current ruling dispensation would have some kind of uh, vision that it would, it would like for the country in the next 20, 30 years. But it has never been published as such. And on the other hand, the Chinese government is very clear about where it wants to be in 2049, which is, the, like you said, the centennial of the coming to power of the Chinese Communist Party. They aspire to replace and displace the US as the global hegemonic power, the, super, the sole superpower in the world. So they are very clear about that. And since they have a stable political system, which is essentially a one-party dictatorship, that's why they are able to plan in that manner. They are able to have consecutive 10-year plans, and then they are able to have a 50-year vision, a 100-year vision because they are pretty certain that they're going to be in power for that long. In a democracy, we have a different kind of setup. So we're not quite sure where, where we're going to be. On the other hand, if you take a, a third example, the United States, the United States has had a remarkably consistent foreign policy. Whichever dispensation, dispensation comes to power, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans or whoever is the president, the foreign policy is remarkably consistent, which points to the existence of what is... Uh, colloquially called the deep state, which is the true power, where the true power really resides in the right. United States. And that is where the foreign policy decisions and uh, policies are framed and decisions are made. So the foreign policy has been remarkably consistent in the US. In India, we have seen repeatedly that when a new dispensation comes to power, very often the foreign policy decisions and policies are completely reversed. Mm -hmm. For instance, when uh, when Moraji Desai came to power, he immediately compromised all of our intelligence assets in various neighboring countries, especially in Pakistan, immediately disclosed the existence of these assets, and they were all uh, neutralized. Once again, when IK Gujral came to power for just three months, he did the exact same thing. 
and uh, when you have a new uh, let's say the congress party comes to power they essentially uh, have a tendency to reverse whatever the bjp was doing in terms of foreign policy in terms of all, all those things so india's foreign policy unfortunately depends on whoever is in power if their whims and fancies sometimes it is a very responsible government sometimes not so responsible especially when you have a coalition government when you have a government that is not strong enough and weak and may not last very long but still they have the the power to make foreign policy decisions decisions and which may not always be in the aligned with the best interest right. of the nation so that's why india doesn't seem to have as far as i can see a coherent consistent long term foreign policy i'm sure the current government does have a vision but i don't think they've explicitly stated it if they stay in power for a long period of time they'll be able to uh, work on that but th- this is the inherent uh, problem and weakness of the indian uh, governance system but this is something that i was going to ask you as a follow up that uh, you know the distinction that you brought about especially between the nature of democracies that india and america are also have certain unique characteristics on its own but when you were to put it as a, a global alliance of uh, great powers naturally there is a clear binary established between a dictatorship like china and democracies like india and america which perhaps gives them a certain sense of advantage over the other governance system uh, this is extremely interesting uh, one of the other common points between india and china that everyone's been discussing of late is uh, the co- population growth because india and china that one area we've been competing with each other for a very long time and it's said that india will take over very soon uh, how will this impact the growth and stability of the two countries going forward well population is a very big factor in the living standards in in the kind of uh, growth that a country can have it can on the one hand weigh the country down because of the enormous impact and and uh, the enormous inertia that a large population can impart to the country on the other hand if you have a large young population it can significantly accelerate the growth in certain senses so india and china are neck in neck and neck in terms of population china's population population growth is decelerating india's population growth is also slowing down it is right now at current currently around maintenance level or something so a uh, population in in my opinion as far as india is concerned some people would would term it uh, a demographic dividend i am of the opinion that if we are not careful it could end up being a demographic disaster because if you look at uh, the way our population was in 1947 it was around 300 million undivided india today today's india present day india which is not the whole of india which which it, it historically used to be today's india has a population of four times that right so you can imagine how much overcrowded the country is how much competition there is for resources for every single train ticket there are four three more people than you had earlier for everything there are multiple people who are who are competing for the same resources so it is not actually a good thing in my opinion if we had managed to maintain that population of 300 million then this country in my opinion could have been much more vibrant much more uh, dynamic much more it could have been better actually because there would be less competition for resources so the chinese have have implemented this terrible one child policy which i think is a terrible example of uh, muddle headed social engineering because right now what's happened is that china is a very strange society every single chinese person has no siblings no uncles no aunts no cousins no nephews nothing it's ridiculous that's the kind of strange society they are living in so what they've done is not very good india should not go in that direction maybe we could think of some incentives for having not more than two children or something like that but i think that uh, we need to ensure we need to be very careful about the population we cannot uh, allow it to run unchecked 1.3 1.4, 1.4 billion is already too much so i think as long as our population doesn't become too old i mean if if you look at the break up of the population as long as there is a reasonable amount of young people who are active at any given point in time as long as that condition is there the the growth of the nation will continue in a, in the right direction in the next few decades china's population is going to be increasingly more and more elderly so that's right. going to be a problem for china you we are already witnessing this in japan japan's population if you look at the average age it's uh, quite it's in late 40s or early 50s i believe i don't have the exact statistics right now i don't have it off the top of my of my head but that's the kind of uh, situation that the japanese population is in so that is kind of slowing down the country it is it is depressing the economy the growth rate growth rate is also below replacement rate so japan is uh, an example of where 
a country should not go. China is going to go in that direction because of the decisions and the policies they implemented in the past few decades. So I think India can learn from these examples and go in the right way. But I think that we have to be careful about the population. It can be a boon or it can be a bane as well. So that's a fine line that we have to walk. But what surprises me even more is that uh, democratic countries like India uh, do have population control laws or or on the verge of designing a few uh, just to make sure that there is no unemployment and um, uh, all the parameters of social growth are met. But when you look at China, in spite of uh, inviting uh, a demographic disaster upon themselves, Xi Jinping proudly proclaims that uh, their citizens will be earning $10,000 per capita very soon. So uh, is that just, uh, you know, being over ambitious or do you actually think the Chinese have the capacity to reach that? I think if you look at the uh, Chinese per capita GDP as of today, it's already reached the $10,000 per capita level. So what he is saying is completely factual. It's based on fact. It's not uh, over overreach or over ambition. It's something that they've, they've already been able to achieve. It's nearly 9,000 or 10,000 or maybe 11,000. I'm not quite sure. It's at that level. So China is reaching now. It is touching the level of a middle income nation or a low middle income nation. So they have managed to uh, grow their economy to that level that it's it's reaching that position. So I don't think that it is uh, it is uh, not factual. It is it is something that they have already nearly touched. So the Chinese economic uh, miracle did happen. It was uh, certainly helped a lot by the United States, and that's something that the U- U.S. has now realized, and that's why they will not be quite so willing to. Uh, help India grow in that manner because they have this doctrine that no nation should be allowed to reach the level of a near competitor anytime in the, in the, in the future. So if a nation is at, 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 as of today at a level that in the next 20 years, it could be a threat to the US in terms of economic might or any other might, then they should work on that nation right away, right now. So that's what we are witnessing right now. Yeah, that's what. Indeed, uh, the security situation is something that the globe, uh, you know, the global leaders are concerned about, and India is also concerned about, especially because of the repeated incursions, uh, the so-called salami slicing that China has been doing, not just for India, but you know, it's been chipping away a lot of the other territories as well. Uh, but India has had a remarkable foreign policy approach, if you were to look at it that way. Uh, you know, in spite of the political binaries that we may have. Today, uh, like Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan said, we are a part of Quad, but we also get discounted oil from Russia. And that's the nature of foreign policy that we have. But we've also seen the predatory economics that uh, China also uh, has towards uh, certain nations, even in our own neighborhood. So what I want to ask you is now, clearly India has also lost a lot of territories. Uh, For example, POJK, Aksai Chin, and even China as a part of its Middle Kingdom plan uh, wants to quote unquote, reintegrate Taiwan and a lot of other territories. How different are the approaches going to be? Well, India's approach has never been aggressive. India has never been an expansionist nation. Historically, it's not been so, except for a few uh, instances when you had these expansionist emperors like Kanishka, like Lalita Ditya, etc. But uh, typically, India has not been an expansionist nation. We I also can mention the Cholas. So typically, India is a pacifist nation, not an expansionist nation. Since 1947, India has looked inwards, not outwards. It it has not even helped Tibet when we should have helped Tibet to stay independent and so on and so forth. So the Indian policy has always been that of benign neglect of its neighboring nations. It's never been, it's never interfered in the internal affairs of its neighboring nations. It's never had any territorial ambitions, any hegemonic ambitions. On the other hand, the Chinese uh, approach is in stark contrast to the Indian approach. China is a forever expansionist nation. They are not content with what territory they have. They always want more. And even if they don't seek someone's territory, they keep on, uh, keep on, uh, going the keeping certain territorial disputes of uh, festering right. like for instance the chinese have territorial disputes with almost all of their neighbors and they keep these disputes simmering from time to time they do them some territorial incursions in the south china sea they use their navy to go and uh, uh, breach other countries territorial waters in the case of this uh, senkaku islands they go and uh, do these over flights with their with their air force taiwan also the same thing in the case of india they keep doing these border incursions recently with the we had the Galwan clash. So the Chinese have this policy of trying to keep all of their neighbors off balance and com- permanently on the back foot. 
so they have a very aggressive foreign policy and clearly that is in line with their uh, hegemonic ambitions of one day in the next 20 30 years becoming the overall global hegemon and to displace and replace the united states as the sole superpower so if they are able to achieve that they will not be a benign or benevolent superpower they're going to be one that will extract a pound of flesh from flesh from every other country that they consider to be their vassal states so that is the the difference the contrast between the approach of india and the approach of approach of china but that has made china a lot of enemies nobody yeah. trusts china nobody feels secure with china in their periphery or as uh, uh, or ha- by having china as their neighbor on the other hand with india no one is afraid of india right no one is scared of india that what's going to what is india going to do next week that that sort of situation is not there so there is a very significant stark contrast in the approaches of these two asian giant countries if i may ask you a small follow up uh, now the aggressive uh, ccp foreign policy that you say uh, that you see today is largely a brainchild of xi jinping but you know foreign policy experts also uh, agree with this that uh, you know certain chinese premiers have had their own uh, foreign policy approaches so perhaps if xi jinping is replaced by some other political leader would you see a different approach uh, to global politics uh, vis-a-vis china that's a very good question so i don't see any change happening let's say tomorrow uh let's say tomorrow the chinese communist party leadership uh, gets dissatisfied with xi jinping and they depose him in a coup and somebody else comes to power i don't see any change happening in the kind of foreign policy that they have i see the chinese foreign policy and the approach towards other countries as being remarkably consistent from the days of mao zedong because mao zedong himself had this ambition of expanding chinese territory and influence to various parts of of, of asia he is the one who who went ahead with the annexation of tibet he was helped obviously by jawaharlal nehru because his soldiers were starving and they would not have succeeded had jawaharlal nehru not supplied the chinese communist party soldiers with tons and tons of rice from india so uh, mao zedong himself started the expansionist uh, uh, policy of the chinese communist party he gobbled up tibet he said that he has ambitions on taiwan and uh, he kept on pushing at various parts of india and so on so it's always been that way but for some time what happened is that the uh, what for the large, for the longest time china was a very poor third world country it was called the sick man of asia or whatever it was it's only after the death of mao zedong when uh, and when uh, deng xiaoping came to power that they completely did this u turn uh, in their economic policy and all that all that they started the uh, trying to emulate what singapore had done in that very small island nation and they had this policy of keep your head down hide your capabilities bide your time and build your economy so for the longest time they had this very meek submissive outward posture that we are ho- harmless we are very meek we will we don't seek to fight with anybody etc and that continued until the time of hu jintao it's somewhere around 2011 2012 that their foreign policy approach all of a sudden changed and you could see that in the body language of their foreign policy uh, foreign ministry spokes people right their body language today you can see it's very aggressive very very harsh that sort of a uh, body language they have today so that transformation happened sometime around 2011 2012 so they've always had this ambition they've always had an aggressive expansionist foreign policy it's not something that is intrinsic to the rule of xi jinping it's always been that way it's just that now the chinese communist party feels that their time has come so they can openly display their uh, their ambitions and all that so even if xi jinping would be replaced i would expect that this this uh, this approach would stay the same it was called a 24 characteristics rule or something right if i'm not mistaken uh, the hide your strength by your time uh, by deng jiaoping uh, so it's it's very interesting because uh, li guan yu was supposed to be uh, the first person who actually saw the rise of china and he was consulted by so many american presidents and at the same time even the chinese premiers looked up to him and even called him a mentor so that is a unique honor to have from both the camps one of the important points you also brought out is the economic uh, comparison vis-a-vis china and india now obviously economic growth is something that we've been extremely concerned about in india do you think that we will be able to catch up because the americans missed all the red flags and uh, nixon and kissinger tried to appease china for a very long time and india even after 30 40 years of ccp aggression at the borders has still not been able to match up to the chinese economic prowess 
Right. So the two countries are a study in contrast. For the longest time, they were neck and neck in the terms of the, in terms of the economy. Until the early 90s or mid 1990s, I think India and China had the same sort of economic uh, growth more or less the same amount of uh, overall gdp that's what we had now the thing is that the chinese their rise was aided and abetted by the americans the americans sought to use china as a counterweight to the ussr in the 1960s the ussr had decided to nuke china over a border clash over a border dispute the americans intervened and uh, threatened the ussr with a nuclear attack if they went ahead with a nuclear attack on china and then they brought china into the american camp they um, opened up the global American economic system to the Chinese, integrated the Chinese economy with their system. And that's what uh, precipitated the eventual significant rise of China. So the Americans created this great monster, their own biggest rival. And like you said, they missed all the red flags of what the Chinese actually intended, intended to do. The Americans, I would say, naively believed that as the Chinese economy would grow, they would become more democratic, the society would become more open. They completely missed the fact that this is an, this is an Eastern nation, it's an Asian nation. It has nothing to do with these liberal democratic values. China has always had an imperial system and the Chinese have never been colonized. They are not mentally colonized that they would start aping the Western system. They still have a little bit of uh, cultural and civilizational pride in their own system. So that's what, as their economy grew, their pride also grew. And what you can see now, the Chinese Communist Party would have a president, Politburo, etc. But it's actually an imperial system. So the Chinese system, uh, Xi Jinping is essentially the emperor of China right now. And that, that's how it is. So it's an imperial dynasty. Now, if you want to compare India and China, until the 1990s, the two economies were essentially at the same level. Then the Chinese economy just took off because of their emphasis on manufacturing and because they became the manufacturing powerhouse for, the, for all the Western nations, especially the United States, because they were able to manufacture high quality goods at very low prices compared to what you would have in the US. So that's how they were able to grow their economy at 10% plus every year, year upon year for more than one and a half or so decades. And that's how they became so big. India, on the other hand, missed the bus. We did not, we had the this forcible uh, set of reforms in 1991 because we were almost bankrupt. Uh, our government said uh, mismanage our economy. But even after 91, the reforms were stop and start, stop and start. That's how it was. So we never really followed up on the reforms and our economy did not grow at the rate that the Chinese economy did. So now what we need, like you said, the Chinese don't consider us to be even a near peer competitor or any, or any such thing. And they have reason not to look at look upon us as, as any anything like equals, because their economy as of today, 2022, is five times, nearly five times that of our economy. So there's no question of being equals, right? They are a much larger power economically. And when you have a large economy, your military is proportionate to that economy. So their military strength is also proportional, proportional to their economy. And our military strength is a proportional, proportional to our economy. So there is no question of seeing India as equals. And they will not see India as equals. So if India and China were to negotiate, China will negotiate naturally from a position of strength. And India will negotiate as not an, as an equal, but as an inferior power. So that's how we stand today. So what India needs is minimum 7 to 8% growth per year for the next 20 years. If we do that, then we will reach the $10 trillion mark. Our economy will grow to, right now it's around $3 trillion, rough, roughly, give or take. So if we grow at 7 or 8% minimum per year, we would in the next 17 to 20 years reach the $10 trillion mark. And uh, 20 years is not such a long time. And uh, hopefully we should grow at, at more than that. If we can pull off 10% plus growth for a long period of time, 10, 15 years, then we will reach that mark faster. Once you reach the $10 trillion economy mark, you are a great power. Nobody can deny that. You will be one of the top three powers in the world. So as of today, only India has the potential of reaching that position. The UK can't do it. The French cannot do it. The Germans can't do it. The Japanese, their, their economy is stagnating. Uh, BRICS nations, only India can do it. And no other economy is able to is, is in a position to reach the, that position. India has such a big population. Our per capita GDP is so low. And we have so many resources. We have so many talented people. So we have all the potential in the world to reach at least $10 trillion in the next 20 years. In the next 30, 40 years, we could reach $20 trillion dollars if we get our uh, ducks in the right row so if the if what the government needs to do see i am not an economist so i cannot give you specific uh, prescriptions of what to do what i can say is we need to ensure that the uh, 
tremendous latent potential of the indian people is unchained and unleashed so for that we will need reforms we will need to ensure that whatever bottlenecks there are in terms of ease of doing business in terms of red tape and all that all of that needs to be removed the government has done significant uh, significantly good work i mean the gst has unleashed the economy until before the gst was in in place we had this octroi system which essentially did not allow one state to trade with another without giving significant taxes and so many delays so the gst has opened up the entire the indian economy and integrated the the nation as into one cohesive whole uh, and then we have the upi system and other things that have really made things much easier for people so i hope that we build on that i think india could be on the on the cusp of a significant spurt of of uh, growth so uh, i see that india i see the potential for india to reach 10 trillion dollars within the next 20 years what india needs of course is 20 years of peace because if there is warfare and this is the this is the decade in which you could have a lot of warfare because everything is realigning right, right now the entire global geopolitical system is undergoing a tremendous realignment so what india needs to reach that stage is 10 20 years of peace if we can manage to have peace then we will reach that mark so the only way to have peace is to have peace through strength so india needs to focus on its military india needs to fo- focus on its various deterrents that will tell other uh, other powers to back off because we can bite back so that's what india needs peace through strength and and high economic growth for the next 20 years that is definitely a big gamble and hopefully we'll be able to get that the other comparison that um, normally western democracies enforce on uh, developing countries like india is the uh, social development indices and the nature of society uh, government rankings and you know uh, you know freedom rankings and all of that uh, but i i don't want to talk uh, exclusively on what the west says today about india and china but uh there was a point in history or there were many points in history where india and china were at neck to neck uh with each other they were also very cordial with each other and they were growing at the same time and they controlled a large portion of the global economic trade together uh what were the uh, what were the freedoms uh in uh, at that point of time in history in comparison to what freedoms are there in india and china today well um, china has always been an imperial imperial power in in um, and the system of governance has been that of an imperial uh, state india has had its own form of governance which is a quasi democratic it's see india is essentially the birthplace of democracy we have had democracy way before the greeks had democracy if you look at the archaeological structure etc the evidence from the so called uh, indus valley civilization era of our civilization then you will see that it was there was there were no royal palaces and any of those things so it was a democratic setup of some sort we don't know exactly what form of democracy it was but you had a democratic system we also have the evidence from the mahajanapadas which were democratic republics you had kings and rulers who were elected they were not hereditary and so on so india always had this democratic form of government government where the people had a lot of rights and a significant amount of power over what happened and what their uh, the kind of governance and life they had so that is the kind of system india had uh, we don't have specific historical details because our historians have never looked into that as to what exactly was the form of government uh, how did elections happen and what specific rights did people have we don't know about that but we know that these were more or less democratic setups that we had during the mahajanapada era sometimes we would have emperors like chandragupta maurya like kanishka the great uh, like raj raj chola rajendra chola like lalita ditya mukta pida uh, like the, like kumara gupta skandagupta etc but even during the imperial eras when the entire subcontinent was unified politically under one central leadership even at that time at the local levels you would have local democracies so at the at the gram panchayat level or whatever people would elect their local uh, representatives and all that so that, that's how it always was so india was that sort of a system uh, the chinese were not a democracy by any means it was always a hard imperial system you had these dynastic cycles in which a dynasty would come to power 
be in vogue for a couple of centuries or so then it would it would crumble there would be a maybe a century of anarchy then a new dynastic cycle would start and that sort of thing so that's the kind of system china had now if we compare the two economies historically india has always surpassed the chinese economy india was always the larger economy india always had more influence on the world culturally and economically economically for instance we know that india had extensive trade with europe india had extensive trade with rome from the western ports in india especially in gujarat saurashtra etc which was at one time controlled by the scythian indo scythian kings rudra daman rudra sinha etc and then the guptas took over and they they continued the trade with europe so europe was addicted to indian uh, indian products like uh, textiles like spices like various other things and in exchange for these things the europeans would send india gold and that's how india became the largest gold repository in the world and that's how india was so wealthy right so india accounted for more than easily more than one third of the entire globe's gdp so that's how well the india was china was always second but china always obviously always was the second largest power in the world economically and otherwise also so india had these extensive contacts trade contacts cultural contacts with uh, with rome with greece with egypt as well with the middle east with persia uh, with east with east africa and also to the east with china with indonesia java sumatra southeast asia and so on so india was essentially the center of the world china was not so much the center of the world china had the silk route which was essentially actually an indian trade route which later on was called the chinese silk route so historically india was the center of the world india was the center of civilization the chinese called india tianzhu which means the center of heaven center of heaven that was the chinese word for india so india was the global cultural superpower india was the center of the center of education the largest economy the trading superpower it was also military super power from time to time so if we compare the two civilizations the oldest civilization was always the greatest and most and the largest civilization in terms of magnitude of the economy and strength china was always number 2 and india was always more liberal india is the is the country that had the democracy the chinese never had that so that's a kind of comparative study of the two civilizations thank you so much for these uh, fascinating insights abhijit ji uh, you know since you are also a youtube superstar right now you may have come across these uh, comparison videos of how military strengths from country to country uh, you know differ uh, for a very long time we've compared ourselves to pakistan and right now our primary competitor is probably china and we can all agree on that and when you look at the kind of weapon systems that uh, china has been developing of late some of them even indigenous for that matter uh, it includes uh, hypersonic weapons and uh, stealth drones and fighter jets and what not and in india we are still busy fighting uh, elections over rafale and bofors and doing dharnas at hcl factories uh, so you know in terms of the military comparison uh, you know where do we stand and how will we be able to catch up uh with china over the next few years so uh clearly the chinese military has had a head start over india's military and china also has this uh, has this ecosystem uh, this research ecosystem this academic military uh, complex academic military industrial complex so the research the engineering and physics and scientific research it happens in the universities that in turn is 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 handed over to the industries and those in turn feed weapon systems and technology to the military so that's the kind of triangular nexus that you have in china it's something the americans first perfected the chinese have emulated that india as of today does not have much of that because our academic system is decrepit our academic system is still fully colonized it is, there is no emphasis on original research at all in the indian, indian academias you go to the iits go to various uh, such so called elite institutions and you will see that they have million dollar washrooms they have million dollar auditoriums but if you see the labs they are 20 30 years old the the equipment there is obsolete so they have the funding but it is used in the wrong ways because the people who run these institutes are not bureaucrats they don't understand science they don't value science they don't value research so that is something i have been talking about for for quite, for quite some time india's education system the india's academic system needs a complete overhaul so india is way behind china in that the chinese have realized that research needs to be done in the universities and that can be used to feed the industrial complex and the military complex so the chinese they instituted a significant set of reforms be- beginning from the 1980s onwards 1990s 2000s and 2010s also so they have done uh, reforms that build up on previous reforms and they have now 
a very uh, you could say a world class academic system where significant really high quality research happens they have research research in material science and cyber warfare all kinds of things so they have significant advantages over india because of this setup that they have built over time they have invested i would say trillions of dollars of money in creating this entire setup so it's not something that's happened overnight it took 2 3 decades and it took a significant amount of funding india is way behind in that but we do have uh, good organizations like hal drdo etc the scientists are great i'm not sure how well these are managed and all that uh, so uh, we we clearly are behind the chinese in that in, in the in terms of technology and all that they also have the advantage of a larger economy so they can pour in more money into the r and d and all that but we also have certain advantages like we have some good weapons and all we have good missiles uh they also have good missiles like you said they are they are uh, building these hypersonic missiles uh, what is a df7 or something i don't remember the exact name of the missile but it's it's called a carrier killer missile so yeah. its objective is not to kill indian carriers but to kill american carriers because american power projection globally happens via its aircraft carrier uh, strike forces uh, uh, strike groups and all that so the at, uh, typically at any given, given point in time you will have two three aircraft carrier groups in the pacific ocean maybe one in the indian ocean region that's how the americans project power at any given point in time so the chinese would want to destroy those aircraft carriers and the truth is that aircraft carriers are obsolete aircraft carriers are highly visible very enticing slow moving targets you can try to defend them with a layer of uh, destroyers and submarines and all that but it's just a mathematical thing if you can shoot enough missiles to overwhelm the defenses it's just a num it's just a numbers game and if you have a hypersonic missile that can evade defenses that's it done so it's aircraft carriers i believe are obsolete they should the, the americans are 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 they are banking on a technology that was last uh, usable in the second world war so that's how it is so the, so the chinese have significant advantages over india i think india could quickly offset that advantage in the next 10 years if we institute the right for kind of reforms maybe we are doing certain things in secret which we will not talk about when we should not talk about those so i think india is currently in a position to certainly defend itself the chinese overall have a very large military but they have their military is tied up in various places for instance it is tied up in the south china sea it is tied up in the in the pacific front and other places it is tied up in other places as well and some of it is dedicated to tibet and to dealing with india so that portion of the chinese military i i believe that india is in a position to handle it we have the right kind of equipment we have the right kind of missiles and all that we have a very good understanding of the terrain what tactics they could use what strategies they could use we would have war gamed all that so i think india is in a good position when it comes to defending itself in india also has the ultimate deterrent with the, which the chinese don't want to mess with we have the red line that they cannot cross the nuclear red line so i think because of these factors we are in a reasonably good position in terms of the irregular warfare especially because of the pandemic and because of uh, the incursions that we've seen at galwan we've seen uh, how rather embarrassingly the chinese are trying to wage an information warfare sp spread propaganda and misinformation around the world whether it uh, deals with the number of soldiers that have been killed on this uh, chinese side or the lab leak theory or something like that uh, so in terms of that uh, where do you think india stands uh, you know in comparison to china especially with the uh, information warfare well we have seen no evidence of indian information warfare capabilities we simply don't have don't seem to have a propaganda division every country has a propaganda division for instance the bbc is the propaganda division of the uk government the new york times the guardian i mean the new york times the washington post and cnn etc are the propaganda arms of the us government similarly the global times and various twitter bots and what not are the propaganda arm of the chinese communist party we don't seem to have that right so we see a lot of misinformation coming from the west right now about what's happening in ukraine we have a lot of misinformation coming from the us from the uk from the ukrainian government etc and it is all disseminated on various social media channels such as twitter facebook etc the chinese have a very strong significant presence on these social media networks like twitter facebook and so on they 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 have all these various uh, global times and what not and th tens of thousands of bot accounts that keep on spreading and sowing misinformation india for some reason doesn't seem to be doing that we have no outlet 
no media outlet at the, like the bbc like the global times that puts forth the indian perspective we have a number of media channels in india news channels some are in english some are in hindi etc but they all put forth the western perspective we don't get to see an indian perspective on glo- in global geopolitics on the re- ukraine russia conflict on anything at all it's always a western perspective for instance there are certain news channels who, which i will not name here they have the reporters or they had the reporters until recently embedded in ukraine with the ukrainian government forces why can't you have a couple of reporters also embedded on the other side so that we get a balanced perspective i'm not saying report from this perspective or that perspective give us both the perspectives to see what's happening in the war from both sides that would give the people of india a balanced objective outlook but they will not do it they will only report from one side so india is reporting as if we are an appendage of the west that's what our media is doing and the government does not seem at least i don't know if we have it but we don't seem to be showing uh, any uh, any willingness right. to to uh, disseminate our own view of how the world is and our own world view to the world so we don't have a bbc we don't have a cnn we don't have a new york times we don't have a washington post we don't have a global times we don't have a, an army of twitter bot accounts or wikipedia editors who do all these aggressive edits that show india in a good light we are perfectly willing to let others uh, decide the narrative to to drive the narrative it it actually appears that even the pakistanis are more active and more effective on social media than india so is it deliberate are we biding our time and hiding our strength or are we truly not doing anything i cannot quite say but that's where we stand right now so we don't seem as of today to have an effective propaganda strategy which every country has so we should also have that in my opinion but as of today we're not showing that i uh, completely agree especially with the uh, institutions that america has i mean we always know about joseph kebbels and you know we attribute most of the uh, propaganda um, brain warfare to him but america has developed its institutions from time to time and uh, the beauty of it is is that uh, it's evolving right uh, during world war 2 they had the committee of war information and later they had the usia and now i think the state department is handling most of it but with india even if it is existing it's probably covert and it's not in public information and uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, clarity on that front abhijit ji uh, india's neighborhood policy is also something that we've been struggling with for a for a very long time whether it's the gujral doctrine or the approach that nehru had adopted at the end of the day most of it has failed i think barring bangladesh to a certain extent and uh, uh, uh bhutan we have very hostile neighbors uh, pakistan china uh, afghanistan for that matter and we've not been able to sort out our own border issues for 70 years um, how do we go about this right our border our our near abroad is something we have completely neglected over the decades uh like you said the gujarat gujral doctrine was a farce it was about uh, destroying whatever assets india had abroad in our near abroad the nehruvian doctrine doctrine was to let everything drift away they we even gave away tibet and all that afghanistan obviously now is in the hands of the taliban which was not in our hands it is nothing to do with us the americans decided to do that and surprisingly there seems to be a reasonable amount of goodwill for india even among the taliban because whatever india did over the past 20 decade two decades over there was see other countries would come and invest for their own benefit but we invested in 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 projects that would help the people so even the family members of the taliban etc benefited from the uh, works that india did in afghanistan for example the dam the agriculture projects and all that the schools the the parliament building and so on and so forth so even the taliban have a certain amount of goodwill towards india which they don't have towards pakistan because there was significant border dispute with pakistan so that's one thing now when it comes to the other countries like nepal we have ruined nepal our government ruined nepal nepal was a hindu monarchy we destroyed the hindu monarchy we we our government at that time whichever it was as we know they fomented the maoist insurgency in nepal and today in nepal is a maoist snake pit all of their leaders and elite are jnu educated which we should not be very proud about even though jnu is in india so that's what we have done to nepal we have ruined nepal uh we don't seem to have any influence or significant influence in myanmar even though it's our neighbor uh we have a reasonably good amount of cultural uh, ties with uh, countries like thailand etc which actually are our neighbors even indonesia is a neighboring country most indians don't realize it india and indonesia have a distance of 200 kilometers only mm-hmm. right so uh so we have reasonably good ties with indonesia with thailand and uh, so on and so forth with sri lanka it's quite interesting 
Sri Lanka has recently uh, come up with a document which is kind of a country to country integration. So as we know, Sri Lanka has been suffering from the Chinese debt trap. Yeah. They, the, the Chinese have trapped Sri Lanka in that. India may be in a position to help Sri Lanka and extricate it out of this debt trap. And right now, the Sri Lankan government of its own volition, of its own initiative, has uh, put out a document. I forgot the name of the docu- document, but they want to integrate the economies and the political systems, etc., of the two countries in such a way that there will be a, a shared electrical grid, a more open traveling, maybe visa-free traveling in the long run, and uh, cultural contacts, people-to-people contacts, more integration of the two governments. The only thing is we are not integrating the two governance systems. So it's eventually you could have the kind of system that we have with Nepal, open borders, the people can move in freely. You can even work in the other person's other nation's uh, territory and so on. So we could have that sort of system with Sri Lanka in the next five to 10 years, possibly if this uh, comes to fruition. So there is a, that, is, that is a ray of hope. That is something, the, a positive development we are seeing in Sri Lanka with the Maldives. During the previous government's time, we had completely lost uh, control of the Maldives. Now, it, it seems that the relations are back on track. The only major problems are Bangladesh and Pakistan. Bangladesh, because we have an open border with Bangladesh, whether we like it or not, that's what it is right now. Uh, the, the border should be under the purview of the central government. But for some reason, the Beng- West Bengal-Bangladesh border seems to be completely open right now. So, uh, so I think India would have in the long run, no option, but to take over Bangladesh when, when it comes to that. So that is something for the future, but that is one of the uh, problems that we are facing right now. The other intractable problem is obviously Pakistan, our permanent enemy or permanent neighbor, the nuclear armed terrorist trade state, the failed state in, at our doorstep. So that is a problem that we need to deal with. Now, in the past few years, since 2017 onwards, we have been way more proactive when, de- with dealing, when dealing with Pakistan than, than ever before. We have done surgical strikes. We have done air strikes. We have even launched, by mistake, apparently, a missile into Pakistan, a supersonic missile. So we are, this government is dealing with Pakistan in, with the right, in the right manner, with the stick rather than with the carrot. And it's clear that the Pakistanis now realize that we are going to call that nuclear bluff. Earlier, it was like Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Don't even uh, d- dare to try anything with them. Now it's clear that that nuclear bu- bluff has been called. So the current government is dealing with these situations in a much different way, in a much more hyper- uh, proactive way, and maybe a more positive way. So it's this, this foreign policy is still in its infancy. In the next 20 years, as India rises and becomes a major power, hopefully resist to the $10 trillion status. Then once you, the the thing is nothing succeeds like success. If you become a successful country, if you become a majorly powerful country, all the little countries around you want to come into your orbit. They want to come into big daddy's big daddy's orbit. But if you are a small, mediocre little country, even though you, you're large, nobody wants to be associated with you. So it's always peace through strength and nothing succeeds like success. So India has to ensure that even if it doesn't defeat Pakistan militarily or doesn't deal with the other countries in an aggressive manner, as long as we keep rising and we become a major economy, everybody will automatically fall in line and start behaving. So that has to be the long-term focus for us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that detailed analysis of the situation. Um, so envisioning this situation probably in the 2040s and the 50s where India and China grow parallelly and uh, they're two great powers rather, uh, how does the West, uh, especially since it's on the decline, America in particular, fit into the entire equation in all of this? What will the role of the West, uh, whether it's America or Europe for that matter, be uh, in comparison to these primary geopolitical actors in uh, Asia? So what we have to understand is we have to first understand what caused the rise of the West. Today, the West, it, it is about 12% of the world's population, but it controls more than 80% of the world's economy. I mean, uh, roughly, I'm saying maybe 70% or so, but it, it controls the entire economic system, the global system, the global institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the uh, reserve currency is the dollar. So they control everything. It's just 12% of the population, but they control the entire economy and the entire global system. So what caused the rise of the West? The West became wealthy and powerful through aggression, through imperialism, through genocide, through mass murder, and through pillage. That's what caused the West to become so wealthy and powerful. Today, the West is not in a position to extract more wealth from India 
or from China. They are still trying to do that from Africa, but it may not last for long. So their sources of their growth have dried out. The only way they have grown is through stealing other people's money and wealth and treasure for centuries, through, through slave markets, through wholesale slaughter, wholesale siphoning of the economy of India, etc. So that's how they grew. Today, that's not happening. So the West is now in decline. And when a powerful, uh, when a big power is in decline, it becomes more aggressive and it becomes more desperate. So that's why I expect that we may see more wars in the coming decade, couple of decades. As the West declines, it will try to lash out and try to retain whatever power it can. If not through diplomacy, if not through the economic means, then through military means. So that is something we may see. Now, it is clear that India is rising. China is also rising. China's growth is now not, not as as rapid as it used to be. It's not growing at 10, 12, 13% per year. It's now growing at around 5% or 6% per year. That's what their official figures are. Maybe it's lower than that. India, on the other hand, is now most likely going to grow at 7, 8% per year. If we do it right, maybe even 10% per year, if we, get, if we get it right. So India is going to rise for some time, maybe the next couple of decades. China, it's going to grow, but not so fast. The West is going to decline. So that is the potential for trouble because the West is going to lash out and try to retain whatever it can through military means. The United States is the major hegemonic power today. It is still the only superpower in the world. China is not yet a superpower. The US is the sole global superpower. So then you have this situation of a Thucydides trap. When the East is rising, the West is declining. The US doesn't want to give up its hegemony. So you may have some kind of um, violent reaction and they may try to impede your progress. They have this doctrine. They don't want any power to even become in the future, a potential competitor. So if they see a country that may be a small economy today, but it has the potential in the next 20 years of becoming a big power, then they will try to sabotage their growth right now. So that is what we may witness. We, meaning India, we may witness from the US. They may try to step up the breaking India activities. They may try to fund various... Uh, organizations or political parties within India through various NGOs. They may try to interfere with the internal domestic affairs of India. They may try to uh, instigate a color revolution like they did in Ukraine, like they did in the Arab Spring, yeah. etc. So these activities may rise now. Right now, what we are seeing as, I mean, yesterday, I believe that Lady Victoria, Victoria Newland, the Deputy Secretary of State of the US, she came to India. She is famous for instigating the Euromaidan revolution which was a coup d'etat that, that was uh, successfully carried out in, the, in, the, in Ukraine, which precipitated the, precipitated the entire 2022 Russia-Ukraine war in the long run. So she is a color revolution regime change expert. And she came to, to India yesterday and she met with various what she calls thought leaders. Who is she to decide who are our thought leaders? We'll decide, right? Who is she to decide? Anyway, so you are seeing this kind of interference from the US in India. This may, in the coming years, be on the rise. They may try to... See, they, they would like India not to rise very fast or very much. And they would not want to see a strong, stable, nationalistic government in power at the center. They would prefer to see a weak, pliable government at the center. So they can, they can keep India at a middle, middle income, I mean, at, at, a, at the position of a small power, not a major power, and use it to counterbalance China to some extent. And when there is no more use for India, you can disintegrate India. So that would be the end game or the long term vision that the Americans have for India. So we have to be careful about that. We have to make sure that they are not allowed to interfere too much in the name of democracy and all that freedom of speech and all that in inter India's internal affairs. So that is something the government will have to take care of. But that is the kind of approach you may see vis-a-vis -vis India. And vis-a-vis -vis China, you may actually see a hot war. If the Chinese make a move prematurely for Taiwan, for instance, then you could see a war happening between the US and China because the Americans simply cannot afford to lose Taiwan. If they lose Taiwan, they will instantaneously lose whatever superpower status they have. People will stop trusting the word of the US that their guarantee as the world's policeman and the world's arbiter of power no longer holds. So then people will make their realignment and try to align with China because China seems to be on the ascendancy. So the Americans simply cannot afford to lose, lose Taiwan. So right now the things are in flux. The entire global system is, in, is realigning itself. We are witnessing a rapid bipolarization of the world and things we need to still see where it goes. 
but that's how i see the world going thank you so much for that uh, this, this has been fascinating uh, hearing from you especially because this puts things into perspective uh, as to why uh, the question that everybody is asking is already the americans have had a rather embarrassing exit from afghanistan and one of the reasons uh, cited for that was the growth of china they wanted to contain china's growth in the indo pacific theater and suddenly uh, all of a sudden you see them getting involved in ukraine uh, so all of these puzzles don't uh, you know match together and suddenly this particular representative's visit to india uh, puts things into perspective especially on why there is a certain uh, orientalist attitude that's always adopted by the west and we are constantly complaining about it not realizing this um that it's a part of their strategy perhaps to contain other powers from growing abhijit ji this probably is a very uh, not so smart question to ask but can china ever become a democracy uh, you know because i ask you this because how how long can they contain the aspirations of a billion and a half people because even in smaller countries you've seen coup d'etats and uh, revolutions arab springs and what not and in china you've still not seen that see i uh, from what i have seen every nation has has a certain character and personality for instance russia as a nation on the macro level has a certain character and personality india as a civilization as a nation has a certain character and personality so does china now if you look at russia the russian people are unfortunately accustomed to tragedy and hardship that's the history of the past 1000 years they have had lots of tragedy lots of hardship they have seen brutal rulers ivan the terrible uh, catherine the great joseph stalin and they have tolerated these brutal leaders what the russian people don't tolerate is failure they will tolerate brutal leaders as long as they succeed and they don't care about democracy they don't need democracy it's not part of their ethos it's not part of their national character they have never wanted democracy democracy has been a western import that has not quite gone down the throats of the russian people so they are perfectly happy with a strong nationalistic autocratic leader like vladimir putin the only thing they will not tolerate is if he fails as long as he succeeds they're going to be happy with him similarly when it comes to china the chinese have always had an imperial system they have never had a democracy it's not part of their culture part of the civilization so i do not see the chinese ever becoming a democracy the the kind of democracy that you have in the west elections every 4 years or 5 years a new government coming in every, in every cycle the chinese don't want it they don't like such things they want stability they want strength so that is the national character and ethos of china japan has also always been an imperial system and right now because of the past 70 years that it's been under us occupation their nas- nation has been shattered if you if you see the japanese people they have lost all their will to live the birth rates have declined precipitously the young people are not even going out of their parents basements today they they, they are not even marrying so japan is slowly dying and decaying because its national character has been stifled so the japanese have always had an imperial system the chinese have always had an imperial system india has always had a quasi democratic quasi imperial system it's been a hybrid system so you have an imperial system an emperor at the highest level typically and at the lower levels you have democracy that's how india has been so i don't see china ever becoming a democracy un- unless it is broken and ruled by a foreign power if that happens then somebody they may impose democracy after destroying china like they have done to iraq so in iraq they first bombed the hell out of iraq flattened the place and then said now we can have elections but what's the point of that right so yeah. democracy i see i am not against democracy i believe in democracy we are the birthplace of democracy democracy is something that is in our blood in india but i don't expect the chinese to change their entire national character and adopt democracy because it's apparently superior there is no right system or, or wrong system whatever works for a certain culture or civilization is best for them it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice that's what the chinese say so uh, i would be perfectly happy for them to have their own system they don't need to be a democracy they can have an imperial system and uh, an emperor at the top and whatever else as long as the chinese people are happy as long as their nation prospers i have nothing against that i would be happy to see a strong china and a strong india co coexist harmoniously i have nothing against the chinese people or the nation let them also have their uh, their growth and their strength these uh, chinese analogies are some of the most uh, complex ones to understand 
and which is why when you speak to a lot of chinese studies scholars even they admit that you know without knowing mandarin you won't know the context in which it is being spoken and i've had some friends attend uh, these foreign affairs conferences in china they have absolutely no idea of what is being said when it is translated into english and perhaps that's funnily also the american understanding of what the chinese threat perception is also is because at the end of the day they read only white papers produced uh, by beijing itself for public consumption uh, abhijit ji um, my last question is you also spoke about the thucydides trap that uh, several countries are trying to avoid and as india and china evolve into potential superpowers of the 21st century how can the two countries avoid um, and maintain cordial relations the only way india and china can have cordial relations if they don't is if they don't have a shared common border if two great powers have a shared common border there is going to be warfare that is the lesson of the past 10000 years of history so the only way you can be at peace with china if you are both rising as great powers is if you don't have a common shared border for instance india and russia we both have a common enemy china because we have extensive shared borders india has a more than 2000 3000 kilometers shared border with china the russians have a similar long border with china right now the russia china boundary issue is settled but the russians know it will be reopened by china at the appropriate time so whenever you have two major powers with a common shared border war is inevitable if both are rising and if both are becoming great powers so i don't see india in china if they both rise if they both become great powers war is inevitable and in the end there will be only one great power in asia so it's about one or the other there can be no coexistence unless tibet becomes free and it becomes a buffer state right so either india goes to war with china china goes to war with india one prevails or the other prevails or both become great powers and tibet is free these are the only scenarios that are viable otherwise there's going to be war it's guaranteed Abhijit ji, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and it always is every time we have this conversation. Thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule and joining us. A pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Abhijit ji. Namaste. Namaste. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content, and to support our work, please visit citti.net.